Our text today is taken from the 11th chapter of the letter to the Hebrews, beginning with verse 23. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents, because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the riches of Christ greater riches, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. The writer is talking about faith the life of faith, confidence in the character of God, confidence in the plan of God, confidence in God's ways and God's will. And he has said that without this faith, it isn't possible to please God. You can't serve God in his great kingdom unless you have this confidence in God and in his willingness and ability to reward you for your diligent search. You can take your place with the ancients of the faith who have won a good report through faith if you don't have that kind of confidence in God and proceed according to it. A number of examples from the lives of the ancients have been given to show us the various areas and aspects of the kingdom of God in which they had faith in the word of God and the confidence of God to guide us. This serves as examples for our lives because of the same basic issues with which we have to deal. We saw, first of all, faith in the creation, faith in redemption, faith in resurrection, faith in impending judgment, faith to follow God when you can't see the way, faith to believe in the importance of the kingdom of God and its righteousness, faith to do that which seems impossible, Faith to believe God when the commandment seems contradictory to reality. Faith that the word of God, and even though it appears to con contradict our sentiments, is important to follow. Faith to believe in the importance and the usefulness of our ministry in this world. And faith in the eventual coming to pass of the word and the plan of God. And today we have an example to take up which shows us, and this is a most practical thing, faith in the importance of doing what we can and trusting God for the rest. You know, I think this is a very timely kind of an, an admonition and one which perhaps escapes in its importance theological thinking from time to time. We have almost assumed in the modern theology that we just sit back and let God do everything and that this is right, it's commanded, it's something that shows our confidence in God most clearly and it's something that keeps our faith pure. However, from the biblical point of view, I think that this is wrong. I have often made the statement, I will make it again, I will stand to be corrected if anyone can bring forth from the scriptures that which will correct me. My statement is this, that God never in the Bible ever did anything for anyone that they could do for themselves. I say I believe in my searching of the Bible through the years that it is right to say it is accurate to say that God never did anything for anyone that they could do for themselves. I will use an often used illustration to point that up. The grave of Lazarus. When Jesus was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, he said to the disciples standing by, he said, you roll away the stone. They could do that. 
and he commanded them to do it. Then Jesus called Lazarus up from the dead. That was something they couldn't do. He said, Lazarus, come forth. But after Lazarus had come out of the grave, wrapped in the grave cloth, he said to them, you people, unwrap him. If Jesus had been a modern pseudo-miracle worker, he would have got up and waved his hand and said, stone, roll away. Lazarus, come out. Grave clothes, fall off. But this is not the way God works. God lends his assistance to us in those areas where we are incapable. You could go on and on with illustrations. Jesus told the disciples, make the people sit down, take what you've got, put it in baskets, and start distributing it. Jesus didn't just wave his hand and everybody had a plate in front of them with loaves and fishes on it. He had them do what they could do. And the power of God came into play at the point at which their abilities ran out. In all likelihood, speaking pragmatically, the children of Israel would never have been delivered from the bondage of Egypt unless the parents of Moses had taken that attitude. They saw that Moses was an unusual child. Something in the Holy Spirit of God that was in them taught them that this boy had a future that was important. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. Now, the Pharaoh had commanded that every male child be killed. The children of Israel were getting too mighty and too strong, and Pharaoh began to worry about them. He was afraid they were going to take over his country. And he commanded the midwives to kill all the male children, and the midwives wouldn't do it. They cooperated with the Hebrew women, and the male children weren't killed. And so finally Pharaoh sent out his own people to do it. And it was at the pain of death that a mother and a father and a family, and remember these people were in slavery. They were absolutely ruled over tyrannically by this Pharaoh and by his hordes. And they were threatened with death if they didn't do this. Most of the Hebrews were forced to do it, but the parents of Moses refused. They hid Moses as long as they could. And when they couldn't hide him anymore, they put him in a little ark, I guess you'd call it, daubed with pitch so it wouldn't take water, and they set him out on the Nile River, and they set him sail. They said, as long as he's alive, as long as there's hope, we've got to do what we can do. Something can happen. We can't just sit down and quit. We can't just give up and throw up our hands. If there's anything left to try, let's try it. Maybe God will intervene. Huh. What a pie-in-the-sky attitude. But in the case of Moses and his parents, God did intervene. And the daughter of Pharaoh pulled the little ark from the river and the plan of God was kept intact because Moses was raised in the courts of the Pharaoh and this was all part of the divine plan. But if Moses' parents hadn't had the faith to do what they could, when it looked hopeless, it looked like there wasn't any point, they could have just sat down in discouragement and wrung their hands and done nothing, but that isn't what they did. They set Moses a sail on the river and God, when they came to the end of their abilities, took up the cause. And the great man Moses' life was saved and the plan of God was preserved. Because the parents of Moses had the faith to do what they could and leave the rest to God. Oh, I think that it would make such a difference in the kingdom of God today in this world if Christian people had that attitude. We know that we are not almighty. We know that it won't work if God doesn't take up the cause for us. But sometimes we don't have faith to do what we can, believing that this is important. And it is important. And all throughout the history of holy people in the Bible, if the people of God had not taken that attitude, then the plan of God would have suffered, and they would not have won the great Reward of the faithful. You see, the parents of Moses are in this great list of examples of people who please God by faith. What did they do? They did what they could. They believed it was important. And they believed if they made every effort that they could make, God would do the rest. All of the old platitudes, some of them wander from the truth. We're not trying to give divine inspiration to platitudes, but most of them have a basis in historical fact. Did you ever hear it said, God helps those that help themselves? 
and a lot of times people chide that attitude, I believe that from the biblical point of view it is upheld. If you don't have any faith, if you don't have any confidence, if you don't have any zeal, if you're not willing to do anything, you're probably not going to get any help from God. And the people of faith that I have known, my mother and my father and on and on, were people who did everything they could. Sometimes it didn't look like it was going to help. Sometimes it didn't look like it was going to accomplish much, but they did what they could. And because of that, God always came through for them in the areas where their abilities were lacking. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproaches of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And here we have an illustration of faith to make right choices and faith in the greater values of the riches of the kingdom of God than in the riches of this world and what it has to offer. It's important, I think, that we gain a perspective of Moses and his position and what he gave up and what he went into in order to really understand this Example, if you read the Old Testament carefully, you would probably come to the conclusion that Egypt, in the time of the pharaohs, was one of the greatest kingdoms in the history of this world. It ranked among the greatest. Maybe it wasn't greater than the kingdom of Solomon. Maybe it wasn't even as great. But the kingdom in Egypt, during the reign of the pharaohs, was a great one, according to the Bible. In the book of Jeremiah, the Lord said through the prophet, you were the tallest of the cedars, a metaphor indicating that this was a mighty land and a mighty kingdom. And the great sandy deserts around the Nile, which we see today, were in those days lush green fields among some of the most fertile places on earth. The Egyptians were great in power. They were an advanced civilization, great in engineering, great in the technology of their day. Some of the things that were done in old Egypt still cause people to scratch their heads. The Great Pyramid, the Perfect Pyramid, was among other things the perfect square of a circle. It's only been in recent years, I don't know if you know this, but it's only been in recent years when working with computers that men have learned to square a circle. The Egyptians not only knew how to do it thousands of years ago, but were able to put those massive blocks of rock in such a configuration as to lay perfect lines, the perfect square of a circle. People still don't know how they were able to accomplish such a feat, and that is by no means all. Egypt was a great and a mighty and a powerful kingdom. And Moses, being thought to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter, was in line for the throne. He was the favorite of the Pharaoh, and he was destined to rule over the most powerful nation in, in the earth in that day and one of the great kingdoms in the history of man in this world. And Moses could have reasoned, look what I could do for these poor enslaved Israelites if I just went ahead and assumed that throne because Moses knew from his mother because his mother was the one who was chosen to be his nurse and she raised him up and gave him an understanding of his heritage and Moses could have said, look what I could do for these people if I was just Pharaoh of Egypt when the Pharaoh died. But Moses had faith in the God of the children of Israel. Moses had faith in the God of creation. And Moses had faith in the God of the future. And Moses said, okay, so I can become Pharaoh and I can rule, and I can be a great master over other men's lives, and I can put up stone buildings and build treasure cities and so on, and I can fight wars and overcome because of my superior armies, and then I can grow and then die, and that'll be the end of me. Or I can give up this temporal 
power and glory, which doesn't really satisfy because Moses had been in Egypt. He'd been in the throne. He'd watched the Pharaoh. He saw the hypocrisy of it all behind the scenes, how unhappy and discontent and empty, mighty and powerful people who lord it over other people's lives are, really. And he said, I can give all that up and I can go out here and I can suffer the reproach of these Israelites as they're down in those mud pits, stomping bricks, mortar and straw together to make bricks and being whipped and beaten every day and mistreated. But soon, someday it'll pass. I'll live through that just like these live through it until they die. And in exchange for that, I'll have an enduring reward which will never pass. Which will never pass. And so what am I going to do? What am I going to do with my life? What is my philosophy going to be? In that regard, I remember an illustration I once heard of a man who reached advanced years and realized that he didn't have much longer to live and felt the pain that comes to men like that who have let down their children and in an effort to try to broach the subject of life and reality somehow because this old man was a Christian, though he hadn't lived up to it much, he brought his son in and he sat him down and he said, Son, tell me about your life and your ambitions if you're in the mood to talk about it. What are you going to do with your life? Well, the son said, I guess I'm going to go on to school and I'm going to get my education. He said, and what then? Well, after I get it, after I've settled on something, I suppose I'll choose a vocation in life and I'll get me a job and I'll start working toward that. And what then, son? Well, I guess like most kids, I'll find a woman that appeals to me and I'll get married and I'll start raising a family. He said, and what then? And he said, well, when I get my family raised and I'll try to put a little way, a little money for old age so we can travel and so we can do things for the kids and the grandkids like you have. And he said, and what then? He said, well, I suppose eventually I'll grow old and I'll die. And the old man said, and what then? What is your philosophy about life? How do you regard it? What are you trying to do with it? These are the questions that Moses faced. Let me tell you some of the things that the greatest philosopher of them all had to say. He said, labor not for the meat that perishes. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on this earth where thieves break through and steal and moth and rust does corrupt. Lay not up for yourselves bags that wax old and silver and gold that cankers, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Man does not live by bread alone, said this great philosopher, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And again he said, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he has. And this philosopher said, he that seeks to save his life will lose it. But he that is willing to lose his life for my sake and for the kingdom of God will keep it forever. And again he said, after giving an illustration of a man who'd worked all his life to lay up for himself treasures, and then he said to himself, now, soul, you've, you've done well, you can sit back and take your ease. He said, that man was a fool because that night he died. And then he asked the question, Whose then shall these things be that he worked so hard for? And he offered the opinion, So is everyone who lays up treasures in this world is not rich toward God. And then he raised this great question, What shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lost his soul? Woe unto ye rich, he said, for you have your reward. St. Paul, the great apostle of the Gentile church, said, I count everything in this world but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord. In the first chapter of Ephesians, in verse 11, he prayed that God would give men the wisdom to understand the great inheritance 
of the saints in life. Again, in the Colossian letter in the first chapter in verse 12, he asked that man might have the wisdom to know the goodness of God and give glory to God for his unsearchable riches that he had given to them in Christ. St. John stood in the 21st chapter of Revelation and saw a new heaven and a new earth. And he saw a place where all the former things, pain and death and sickness and sorrow and unhappiness and disappointment were passed away and there were only joys forevermore. And in the 22nd chapter, he saw a river of the water of life clear as crystal flowing out of the throne of God. And he saw Eden restored. He saw the tree of life on the banks of the river. And he saw the Son of God giving light, light to the mind, light to the soul, light to the body, light to the earth of all of those who are with him. And they reign forever and ever. I believe if Joshua were here in the Christian world today and drew the line again as he did in the days of old, that most Christian people, most professing Christian people would be on the wrong side of the line. Faith to believe in the greater values of the riches of Christ and of the kingdom of God. Faith to suffer now for the glory then. Faith to lay down in the dust of life, the glory of mortality, and to identify with Christ and his people and his kingdom in order to take your life up again in that day in a glory which will never fade, a glory which will never pass, faith to make right choices, faith in the greater riches of the kingdom of God. Do you have that faith, my friend? It is necessary. It is something we cannot get by without. It is important in order to serve God acceptably and to earn a good reward against the future. You say, well, I just can't do it. I'm afraid I'd like to. It's all a very beautiful idea. I'd like to do that kind of thing, but I'm just afraid. I live in this world. It's a real world. I have to function here. There are pressures here. Moses could have looked at it that way. But Moses forsook Egypt and went out and took his place with God's oppressed people, not fearing the wrath of the king. Why wasn't he afraid? Why wasn't Moses afraid to make this choice? Because, and here's the secret to it all, he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Oh, we can see life, its pressures, its consequences, and its issues, but all too often, we do not see in the eye of faith the almighty God. We do not see the day of judgment. We do not see the time when life is past. We do not see the handing out of rewards. We do not see the eternity of the future because we're not looking by faith. We're looking only by the sight of the eyes and we miss this all important reality. Him with whom we have to do let us have grace whereby we may serve him. Let us have faith whereby we may see him. Let us have confidence whereby we may commit ourselves to these greater causes in life and forsake these burdensome fallacies of mortality that rob us of our joy and our hope for the future.